thank you, Liam, and uh, grace and peace to you all. I trust all of you have found your way here. I know it hasn't been easy. We have sent out maps by email last night, and we have sent out volunteers to try to find people on campus to send them this way. But Brock is a big campus, and there's, uh, there's quite a, many different entrances, so it's a bit difficult. But thank you, and please do grant us some grace uh, in all of that. Well, without further ado, we'll get started. How many of you have ever watched the movie, The Book of Eli, starring uh, Denzel Washington? Okay, some of you have, some of you haven't. It's, it's not quite a family-friendly movie, so I wouldn't be surprised if not everyone had watched it. Uh, in a, as a matter of fact, I believe it's rated R, so uh, it is quite a, a, a difficult and dark movie to watch. But for those who have, and I'm sorry if, I've given, if I'm going to give away any spoilers for those who haven't and are planning to watch it. Um, I mean, it's been out for quite some time. Uh, the movie is about the preservation of the Bible in an obviously fictional post-apocalyptic world. Uh, his mission is to uh, deliver this book to a safe location uh, where it can be stored for the future of humanity. And, and Denzel plays this character named Eli. He guards what is believed to be the last copy of the Bible. And it happens to be in Braille. If you're not familiar with Braille, it's that language system of raised dots, uh, essentially that language system developed uh, so that the blind could read. And over the course of the film, as you watch it, you, we find out that Eli had actually committed the whole book to memory. So when the point comes when the book is taken from him forcefully, well, at one thought you begin to think, oh, all is lost, so the Bible has been lost, but it's not actually lost. He has it memorized, and then he passes it on to someone else who carries on his mission to bring it to a safe location so it can be preserved and then mass-produced. The story essentially brings us through challenges and risks uh, that this character has to go, but it also illustrates the significance of the book itself. Within the context of the film, within that narrative, it's almost as if civilization depends on this book. Well, there is certainly truth to that. In addition to being the top-selling book in the world and over the course of all literary history, the Bible is also the most printed book in the world, especially when you consider how many have been printed just for giving away. They're not really accounted uh, amongst the book sales reports around the world. For missional causes, many have been produced. And just to give you a bit of an idea, this is a few years back. In 2015, the Guinness Book of World Records estimated that more than 5 billion copies of the Bible had been printed. 5 billion copies. There's not a single book in the history of mankind that comes close to that number. The Bible is of such significance, it is of such power, that is, per Steve and Jackie Green, the founders of the Museum of the Bible based in Washington, D.C., if you haven't been there, I certainly recommend it. It's a fantastic place to go. They say it's impacted and given shape to much of Western human history. And later today, in our final session, Vishal Mangalwadi will be speaking much to that as well. And they wrote the following, I quote, Indeed, the Bible has stirred up controversies that have affected empires. People have been burned alive in their attempt to translate it for the common person. It's been the source behind those who worked in England to abolish the slave trade. It has challenged cultural views on women, children, and the oppressed. It guided the first Christians in the first century toward a morality unseen in the Roman world. It moved a young monk to call out injustices in the church, an act which led to the Protestant Reformation, and has inspired artists such as Bach and Rembrandt it was the guiding light for world-changing intellectuals like Blaise Pascal. Its printing was one of the most significant events of the last millennia, end quote. Well, could you expect anything less from the inspired, inscripturated Word of God? What is the Word of God? Now, for those of us who come from a Christian background, the question, what is the Word of God, might seem a bit redundant. But for those of us here who perhaps do not espouse a Christian or biblical worldview, or even for those who will look at our sessions later online, the Word of God is the entirety of the Old and New Testaments. 
The Bible is a collection of 66 books, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. And the word Bible is derived from the Greek word biblia for books, which, though plural, came to be used as a singular noun and stands for the collection that we as Christians acknowledge to be the Word of God. Now, this idea or concept of collecting these holy writings into a formal collection developed in early Hebrew Christian thought. The prophet Daniel, for example, spoke of the prophetic writings sometime in the 6th century B.C. as the books in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. The writer of 1 Maccabees referred to the Old Testament corpus in the 2nd century B.C. as the holy books in chapter 12, verse 9. Jesus referred to the Old Testament books as the Scriptures in Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. And another one in the A.D. side of history, the Apostle Paul referred to them as the Holy Scriptures in Romans chapter 1, verse 2. Altogether, the entirety of this corpus of literature is inspired. It's breathed out, God-breathed, for that is what is meant by the term. Not because the church declared it to be inspired, Historically, through the history of the church and the church fathers, it has always declared that the church has discovered the inspiration of the Word, has not declared it or determined it to be, but because the Scriptures declare themselves to be, and because its propositions can be verified as being true. Where do the Scriptures declare themselves to be God's breathed out Word? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. All Scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, a noteworthy fact on the words inspiration, and this was presented by Greg Bonson in one of his lectures. He was a Christian apologist and intellectual who's long since gone to be with the Lord. The Bible is the only holy or religious book that self-testifies of its inspiration. Not the Quran, not the Vedas, not any other religious book. As a, and as an inspired text, it is, in fact, invaluable, which means it cannot be wrong in what it teaches. It's also inerrant and means it's free from all errors. Why? Because God himself, being the source of this revelation, is infallible and inerrant. Now, that's some very basic bibliology for some of you, and I know probably some of you are saying, well, you know, I came here for something a little bit deeper, something maybe more like a steak I can munch on, where we're going to take a bit of a deeper dive into the nature and role of the Word of God. Well, the Bible is more than just a collection of religious books. It's more than just a historical and cultural treasure trove of literary antiquities. It's more than a highly revered book for a religious community that called itself Christians or followers of Christ, and whatever branches within Christianity you could possibly imagine. Given that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, note the singular here, underlying all the diversity of the Scriptures is the unity of the Word of God, and given that there are no sure grounds in our human methods, this is because we're fallen and limited beings, which I'll expand on later, the Word of God is the only firm foundation for all of human life. Not just for the Christian, not just for the supposedly religious, as if religious neutrality was ever a thing, not just for the reader, but for all of humanity, for all of civilization. I'll put it another way. The Bible is the only lens by which we can see the world for what it truly is and by which we can order our lives. I'll repeat that. The Bible is the only lens by which we can see the world for what it truly is and by which we can order our lives. Since the Enlightenment, though we do see traces of this in the patristic age, that is to say the age of the church fathers in early church history, uh, with the meddling of Greek philosophic thought, we see plenty of that, there's been an increasing tendency to approach the word with our own presuppositions, our own pre-committed beliefs, presuppositions which are contrary to the word. And while this is true of fallen man ever since the Word was first given progressively. We understand the Bible was not given in just one fell swoop. It was a, pro a progressive revelation over the course of history. 
It has, however, become much more systematic, much more consistent. And on such occasions, when we bring our own presuppositions to the Word, the meaning of the Word is lost to the reader. William Tyndale, the English Bible translator of the 16th century, once wrote that the Christian scholars of his age were pumped full of so much scholastic and heathen methods and thought and elaborate humanistic uh, devices and machinations that when the time came to read the Scriptures, it was like a wall had been built around it and its meaning had been locked away. Now, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Obviously, I did not memorize what Tyndale wrote. You want the original quote? It's there on the screen. But the point he makes was valid. The truth is, it's not we who come to our understanding to the Word of God. It's not we who bring our own presuppositions to the Word of God. As the American Christian philosopher H. Evan Runner had put it, it is the Word, which is the power of God, that comes to our hearts and opens our eyes so that we may understand the singleness of meaning of all the many Scriptures. As the inspired Word of God, it's therefore authoritative. And being authoritative, it supersedes our understanding. It supersedes our presuppositions. Now, Vishal, who will be speaking at the last session of our conference, often uses the illustration of five blind men and an elephant as it relates to knowing the truth. Here's my slight take on it, and I'm sorry, Vishal, for borrowing it, if in case you're using it later today. In the illustration, five blind men all touch a part of an elephant and try to define what an elephant is. You know, one person who's maybe touching the tail, another person's touching the, tr the trunk, another person is touching the ear, and each of them will have a different response as to what they think an elephant actually is. And it appears as if they all have a piece of the truth. But the person who really has the truth is the sixth person who is not blind, the only person who could possibly tell it just as it is. You see, we are limited beings. We're incapable of grasping the total cosmic scale of our reality. And the effect of our sin further hampers our efforts, causing us to suppress the truth. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to Rome, wrote, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. To translate the latter portion of that verse into more understandable terms, Paul is saying that our nature, tainted by sin, what is sin? The violation of God's law, causes us to suppress the truth, the truth of God. So we cannot possibly arrive at the truth ourselves. We cannot arrive at it independently. The truth must come to us, and it has in the form of the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, who is Himself the Word, as well as in the form of God's inscripturated revelation, the Word, which reveals the Christ to us. And what does this Word reveal? Firstly, it reveals who God is. Not sure if you've taken note, but Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 does not begin with man. It does not begin with creation. It begins with, in the beginning, God. The God of the Bible is not one of many. The God of the Bible is not some impersonal being or some abstract entity. The God of the Bible is the sole, sovereign, personal creator God. Secondly, the Bible also reveals who man is, what he is, and who he is meant to be. And of course, I'm including women in that as well because I'm referring to mankind in general. And thirdly, it reveals God's will for man, his purpose, his intended function, his created destiny. And the content of that revelation not only informs us as to the state of things, as to what is, what is not, where things stand, it also serves as a guiding and governing principle as to how we ought to live our lives. And this is laid out in the Word as it relates to our threefold relationships. How we ought to live in relation to God, how we ought to live in relation to one another, and how we ought to live in relation to creation. But the content of this revelation is not static. It's not some abstract concept. 
It's laid out over the course of a historical narrative, a schema that begins with creation, is then followed by the fall, and it ends with redemption, which we should note has not yet been fully manifest yet. We're still in that process. It's in the Word that we learned of the original state of things, what happened that altered the state of things, and what was done to remedy the state of things. With this, we come to understand the world as not being purposeless, as being without meaning, but rather as having an overarching story, a meta-narrative. This is what led Renner to refer to the Word as a divine thesis, in the sense that the Word of God posits the truth, and it was the truth that first was, after which followed distortions of the truth as a result of the fall. But with the provision of the word unto men, the word has been regarded to be the republication of that divine thesis. To use Renner's words, the word of God is God's thesis, that is, the first and only true statement by which the nature of our life in the world is elucidated and its way thus directed. Now, what do we mean by the truth as it relates to the revelation in the word? We mean the whole of reality in its central religious meaning. You see, the presuppositions or the worldview provided by Scripture provides for us the thinkware for a right understanding of all things as it relates to God, ourselves, and our place in the world. And not just in terms of information, but how we ought to operate, how we are to function, how we are to think and live. The Bible is the lens by which we see the world, the lens by which we interpret the facts of our world. Now, for those who might be unfamiliar with the concept of worldview, it can be defined as a network of presuppositions which are not verified by the procedures of natural science regarding reality or metaphysics, knowing or epistemology, and conduct or ethics, in terms of which every element of human experience is related and interpreted. Everyone has a worldview. There's not a single person who doesn't have a worldview. If you don't have a worldview, you're dead. It's a set of presuppositions of what we believe to be true, by which we interpret our human experience. But not every worldview succeeds in providing man with a proper understanding. In other words, not every worldview provides man with truth. As a matter of fact, the claim of Scripture is that nothing can be truly known outside of itself. Where do we see that? Well, for starters, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight or understanding. And, of course, we understand by the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of the Holy One being equivalent to what we understand today as faith, belief in God. Now, that's not some fortune cookie wisdom. That's not some devotional tidbit that you can meditate on the mornings. I mean, you could certainly do that, but there's more to it than that. Wisdom, particularly as it relates to wisdom literature, the Hebrew understanding of it, encompasses a right understanding of all things, of everything that happens under the sun. And such wisdom is unattainable outside of the means by which God has made, made it known to the world. Following this biblical principle or truth claim, the late apologist Cornelius Van Til carried it out to its inevitable implication. In his tract titled, Why I Believe in God, he writes, Now, in fact, I feel that the whole of history and civilization would be unintelligible to me if it were not for my belief in God. So true is this that I propose to argue that unless God, the God of Christian theism, is back of everything, you cannot find meaning in anything. Put differently, we might say that by virtue of the fact that we are God's creation and that we live in God's world, and that we were created to live in and to function in this world, we cannot then possibly arrive at any true knowledge without first presupposing the God who created us. And that's not to say that we cannot arrive at any knowledge. 
but that we cannot truly know anything outside of the worldview or presuppositions provided to us by the divinely inspired Word. Now, you might say, you know, hold on a sec. What about the simple facts of life? I mean, the statement, for example, that 2 plus 2 equals 4, you know, that remains true for everyone, doesn't it? Well, whether it's mathematics, physics, logic, etc., much of what we see, much of what we observe, much of what we verify to be true in this natural world, all this remains the same across the board. I mean, otherwise, how could you possibly have any conversation with anyone about any subject or discipline? Well, it's a, good, it's a valid question. And what Van Til has to say on the matter, well, he answered that question by making a distinction. He makes a distinction between knowing and truly knowing. The naturalist, for example, can agree with the Christian that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But can the naturalist make sense of that mathematical formulation? Can he make sense of mathematical law in a universe that's devoid of a lawgiver? Can he make sense of mathematical law in a universe that is governed by random causality, given that its point of origin is random probability itself? The Christian does not have that dilemma, however. He has the answer to those questions because he can make sense of the intelligibility of reality. It's what some philosophers have called the predication of reality. Those answers ultimately lie in the God who has revealed himself through creation and through his word. And as it relates to creation, I don't just mean the surface level of what Paul refers to in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, in which he writes, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. I mean, it's true that everyone marvels at the sun, the moon, and the stars. Not that long, not that long ago, people were admiring the northern lights that come all the way down here, and if you had clear night sky, you'd be able to see that, that, that marvel. No, I'm not talking about the surface level. I'm not talking about what we can see right in front of us. I'm referring to creation at a much deeper and sophisticated level. Drawing the curtains back to see the backstage, so to speak. Mathematical laws, physical laws, laws for organic growth, laws of thought, economic and aesthetic laws, etc. As Renner puts it, every law in our creational reality is every word of God by which he has subjected creation to his will or rule. Law is thus nothing other than the will of the sovereign God for his creation. I mean, just look at the whole creation narrative. Look at the two opening chapters of Genesis. It's not possible to have a right understanding of reality, a reality that we can make sense of, if we don't first understand our reality in light of the sovereign creator God. And to understand such, we need the inscripturated word of God. We need the republication of God's revelation as it concerns the truth of all things. And that republication was necessary in part because of the noetic effects of sin. That is to say, the influence of sin upon the human mind. What Paul refers to in Romans chapter 1 verse 8. Though also in part because God so willed to also to reveal to us the means of redemption of all things. I mean, this audacious claim, and it is an audacious claim, but it's a claim that the scriptures can certainly make given that it's the inspired Word of God, that we cannot truly know anything outside of the worldview or presuppositions provided to us by Scripture, might lead us to question our whole learning process as it relates to the very disciplines. How can we truly know anything in the disciplines? How much can the disciplines inform our understanding of the world, if at all? The answer, of course, is not irrationalism. But the answer is not either found in rationalist thought and whatever came about from the Enlightenment and rationalist thinking. You see, we've all been culturally conditioned, and this due in part to the influence of Enlightenment or rationalist thought, to think that the disciplines or the sciences can be viewed and understood as abstract or independent entities. 
And for many, these entities have actually become absolutized or even deified, and I'll talk about that later. But to partition away the disciplines or sciences from their central unity of meaning is to take away what makes those fields meaningful and intelligible. The late Dutch scholar Vollenhoven, as well as Van Til, argue that to understand the very disciplines or sciences, one must see them in the revealing light of the Word of God. It's not to say that the Word serves as a textbook, as a guide to the disciplines. No one says that. No one's saying that the Bible is going to teach you chemistry, physics, and all you need to know about the natural sciences. Not directly. But rather that the Word provides for us the intellectual parameters, the propositional truths by which we can rightly understand the disciplines. To put it another way, it's when we understand what the Word of God is and the function that it ought to occupy in our lives that we can then have a biblical Christian worldview by which we can see the world and by which we can order our lives. An excellent illustration of this truth was provided by R.B. Kuyper, former chairman of the faculty of Westminster Theological Seminary and former president of Calvin College. Initially, the illustration was meant to convey the function of man within the created order that he had been created for. But it also serves to explain how we can only make sense of reality within the Christian worldview, within the truth itself. The illustration consists of an elderly woman, a friend she visits, and a fish. And it goes as follows. An old lady went to visit a friend. When her hostess disappeared into her kitchen for a few minutes, this peculiar lady got up out of her chair and walking about the salon, found a bowl of tropical fish behind the grand piano. And in a sudden inspiration, she reached her hand into the bowl, lifted out one of the fish, and dropped it tenderly onto the rich carpeting that covered the floor. And as she did so, she muttered to herself, Wicked old woman keeping you shut up in that little old bowl. I'm going to give you the freedom of this whole salon. Of course, the fish promptly proceeded to expire. Why? Because it had been removed from that law area for which it had been created. This is the case with fallen man, the person who has essentially rejected the truth of God. Outside of the worldview or the presuppositions provided by the Word, he can make no sense of our world. He can make no sense of the intelligibility of our world. The necessary preconditions for intelligibility, referred by Van Til and Bonson, are forfeit the very moment that man steps outside of the truth and into his imaginary perspective or distortion of the cosmos. And his failure to make sense of reality does not begin with essentially creation outside of himself, but with his own selfhood. What is man? The self is plunged into obscurity, having been yanked essentially from its true religious context. You see, man cannot truly be man if he cannot truly know himself, or the world in which he lives, or the God behind the world if he is not within the parameters or the presuppositions or the worldview provided by the inspired word. And what is most telling is that though the natural man has concocted his own antithetical worldview, he does not live according to his worldview, at least not consistently. The run-off-the-mill naturalist, for example, who happens to believe in a non-theistic universe, should, in theory, believe in the fluidity of the whole world, of the whole cosmos, an ever-changing reality, being the inevitable product of random chance. In such a world, there can be no such thing as uniformity. There can be no fixed laws. You know, one moment the law of gravity applies, the next it doesn't, and you're floating off to the moon. One moment you press your toothpaste and it comes out, the next moment you press it again and it goes in. One day, two plus two equals four, but the next no longer does. It equals five or six or whatever number you want to come up with. But the naturalist doesn't actually live like that. He doesn't expect that. He doesn't wake up in the morning terrified that maybe he's floated off because the law of gravity's changed. 
He does not anticipate that. In his living and in his thinking, he anticipates that which is contrary to what his presuppositions imply. Bonson referred to this as pushing the antithesis, pushing the consistency of one's thoughts all the way to its extreme. You see, the natural man in his antithetical worldview is a walking and talking contradiction. He believes in an altogether different worldview than what is actually revealed by the words to be true. But he lives and breathes in such a way that presupposes the God of the Bible, that presupposes that very truth. Now, there's a lot more depth here that I would love to go into, but for the sake of time, I'd encourage you to check out Bonson's book, Pushing the Antithesis, as well as my own book titled Apologetics, and you'll find that last book at the table at the back. But for now, it's enough to say that the natural man can do little else than borrow the capital or borrow the grounds of the Christian worldview for his own living and thinking. Now, I've said much about the word being the divine thesis, as it being the lens by which we can see the world and by which we can order our lives. But how do we make sense of alternative philosophies and worldviews? How do we make sense of the antithesis? Well, we can begin by first asking what is meant by the term antithesis. It's not meant in a subjective sense as saying the distinction between uh, me and you. It's also not meant in the sense of two people groups, such as those of the city or kingdom of God and those of the city of man, to use St. Augustine's terminology for the people of God and the people of the world. No, the definition of antithesis is provided by Renner as the difference of response to the Word of God, which coming into the world as a revealing light for our life, effectuates with the sovereignty of its divine author an abiding line of division between ways obedient and disobedient. In other words, antithesis is the product and result of our disobedience to God's Word. It's what stands in opposition to the truth revealed in God's unified revelation, that being His creation and His inscripturated Word. It is, to put it simply, a systematic and religious distortion of the created order or the creation order. And the antithesis is, in fact, quite varied. The individual who rejects the reveal the truth of God for the lie will still live subject to the created order that God established. And by virtue of the fact that he cannot escape God's world, he is haunted by the truth of who God is and what he or she as a created individual was meant to be. It doesn't matter at the end of the day how much one claims to be a secularist or a naturalist, even in a post-fall context, we're still by nature religious beings. And because man is inescapably a religious being, he cannot help but replace God with some absolutized aspect of creation. In fact, it's the only place he can turn to, though it proves to be a dead end. The ancient Greeks, for example, who had their own pantheon and mythology, believed that their godlike beings were ultimately subject to a more ultimate law of necessity, what they call ananke. It was a necessary form of some sort that determined everything. And as an abstract concept, it became absolutized, it was deified. As Renner laid out in the realistic philosophy of Plato to such absolute abstract law essences, so for example, the beautiful itself, the just itself, these hold as much for the gods as well as for men. See, it's always been the tendency of fallen man to substitute the true God with some absolutized aspect of created reality. Paul, again, in his chapter to the Romans, explains that man can worship only one of two things, the Creator or the creation. And there's no third object of worship. Upon this revealed truth, Christian scholar Peter Jones, in his book One or Two, explains that there can really only then exist two types of worldviews, oneism and twoism. In a oneist worldview, man worships some aspect of creation. It's a worldview in which there exists no distinction between creator and creation. And within such a worldview, distinctions cannot therefore exist, given that the ultimate distinction that's required for the intelligibility of reality is not maintained. It fails, in other words, to meet the preconditions of intelligibility. If there's no 
distinction between create and creation. There therefore cannot be distinction between numbers and letters and alphabets and so forth. And it is specifically the wettest worldview which encompasses every worldview that is contrary to that of the Word. That is the antithesis. While the twoest worldview, on the other hand, is that worldview that does preserve that creator-creation distinction. It does meet the preconditions of intelligibility. It is nothing other than the divine thesis, the inspired Word of God. What might be an example of the antithesis? Well, returning to man's struggle with understanding himself apart from the Word, consider his attempts to define himself. Over the course of human history, man has never independently arrived at a point of satisfaction as it relates to the meaning of the self, the human self. There really has been no universal consensus all around the world. The tendency has always been to absolutize a certain aspect of God's creation, and we see this, for example, with rationalism, materialism, aestheticism, organicism, technicism, etc. All the isms that have sought to provide a totality view of man. Within rationalism, which, by the way, is an absolutization and deification of our analytical capability, man is conceived of as a rational being. Within materialism, as a material organization within technicism, as a technical being. In the end, after much thought and debate and countless philosophers and ponderers, the question remains, just what is man? They certainly grasp something of the truth, like the blind, blind man with the elephant, but they distort it. They exaggerate it. We recognize ourselves to be rational beings, of course, but there's more to us than just being rational beings. We're certainly emotional beings, but we're much more than just emotional beings. We're certainly a composition of material, but we are much more than just material. The same can be said for all the theorized conceptions of what man could possibly be. Essentially, without the light of the Word, without the power of the Word to open our eyes, which we understand involves the work of the Spirit of God, we cannot make sense of who we are, let alone the world, and the God behind the world. Well, how are we then to respond to the Word? It was not meant to be another book simply shelved away for our casual reference and reading. It was meant to be the lens by which we can see the world and the guiding principle by which we can order our lives. Well, let me tell you how we ought to respond to the Word. We are to submit to its authority, which means that we are to submit to its propositional truth, which means that we are to renounce our pretended self-sufficiency, our own presuppositions, in order to embrace the presuppositions of Scripture and depend upon the one whom the Word reveals. If it's a proper understanding we desire, we first require a proper understanding of ourselves. And if we hope to have a proper understanding of ourselves, we need ultimately a proper understanding of God. And our understanding of God, man, and creation are intimately tied together. They're not separate entities. They're not separate concepts. We see this by virtue of the fact that man was created in the image of God as revealed by the Word. But we couldn't know such thing without the Word. Scripture provides the light that we need. As I had said earlier, our sin already hampers our efforts to know the truth independently. But we are also finite beings that can only attain true knowledge when it's in relation to the sovereign creator God. Without him, man is essentially left to grasp in the dark. I mean, if such a God were to be somehow erased by a magic eraser, and I'm borrowing, by the way, Friedrich Nietzsche's thought, we would lose the meaning behind everything. I mean, just read The Madman by Friedrich Nietzsche. This is what Van Til argued. We're left asking, what does it mean to be man? What does it mean to be moral? What does it mean to be alive? In man's radical autonomy, in his quest to do away with God in every respect, man actually digs himself his own hole. He's at a loss, a devastating loss, not only philosophically, but totally. 
Man can find no true answers to his questions, not independently from the divine thesis. It's the Word that reveals to us the God behind creation, and in light of that, that reveals our own selfhood in its radical, integral unity. Why yield to the Word? Because apart from having the thinkware by which we can understand the world and order our lives, we're also promised life. And life not in the abstract sense, but in the person of Jesus and how that is applied to us by the Spirit of God. The order of our lives would be nothing more than mere moralism without the redeeming life that Christ brings. And it's one of the many blessings of surrendering to the Word. And I don't mean a surrendering solely in a spiritual sense, but in a total sense. The Word doesn't reveal to us a privatized spirit devotional, spiritual piety. It re reveals to us a faith that relates to every aspect and sphere of life. It is quite literally a world and life view. And blessed are those who submit to it. Blessed are those who read it, who study it, who meditate upon it, and who apply its truths. Here are a few passages that speak towards that blessedness. From the historical writings, the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. From the book of Psalms, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. From the mouth of Jesus in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 to 26. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and the beat on the house, but it did not fall because I've been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And from the pen of James in the first chapter of his letter, verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. As I look to bring our first session to a close, the corpus of the divine thesis, the message and the understanding provided by the inscripturated revelation of God, is not to be treated lightly or to be laid to rest on deaf ears. They're weighty. They're weighty words of life. And given that it was always meant to be the very guiding and directing principle of our lives since the moment it was first progressively revealed, it should be of no surprise to us that the Bible has endured to this day in spite of great tribulations. When the Babylonians, for example, destroyed Jerusalem in circa 586 B.C., they destroyed everything, the walls, the temple, the beautiful artwork, whatever was not destroyed was looted. And yet in spite of this, the ancient texts endure. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70, they too destroyed the temple. This is where the Torah and the books of prophecy were stored, and they too would have fallen victim to the flames. And yet these texts have endured. Of course, the New Testament texts were no stranger to these conditions. Before the sanction of the Christian religion by the emperor Constantine, the biblical texts were outlawed and deemed a threat to Roman religion, governance, and life. Texts were confiscated and burned. Their discovery reported to Roman authorities. Their owners arrested and punished. This was most vigorous, most rigorous under the emperors Galerius and Diocletian between the years A.D. 303 to 311, a time in which Christians were burned alive and fed to animals in the Roman Colosseum. And yet in spite of all this persecution, in spite of every attempt to censor the biblical text, to expunge it from existence, and to intimidate those who clung to it, it is rigorously endured to this day. I mean, I can go on further in relation to its miraculous history, but our next speaker will have much to say about its transmission and preservation. The point is, 
It is endured to such an extent that it sets itself well apart from any other book. And it is done so simply because it is the inspired Word of God. Being, therefore, the inspired Word of God, it calls us to respond to its revelation, to submit to its truth, to embrace it as a divine thesis that it is for our understanding and ordering of all of life, to not heed its call, to not surrender to the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ, the one in whom the diverse scriptures find their unity, the one who gave his life in order that we might be redeemed from our sinful state, is not only to remain in the lie and the antithesis, lost in the dysphoria that it produces, it also ensures our condemnation and the judgment that awaits us for our unforgiven sin. To renounce our own presuppositions and to embrace that of Scripture is in truth the acquirement of wisdom. To see things for what they truly are, to see our human context within the framework of the whole of created reality, it is the divine principle by which to direct our goings, and it makes an unmistakable claim of exclusivity. Thank you very much.